Friends, let's look at some of the or uh, all the topics of chapter one, class ten, mathematics. Let's look at them relatively quickly, revise them, and also solve some problems. So, the key idea is that this chapter is worth six marks in your exams. Of course, it's very important, and it has been allotted fifteen periods. So, what does that mean? It means that although it is very scoring, very important chapter. students have trouble understanding these concepts of number theory because they are slightly abstract right right off the bat, <laughs> bat we start with like one of the difficult student topics right i mean the students have difficulty it although in my from my view it is very simple but uh, euclid's division lemma and division algorithm right so division algorithm is based on euclid's division lemma and it is an algorithm to find the scf of two numbers we have done several classes on on uh, euclid's division lemma so i encourage you to definitely look at those classes but in very brief if we want to understand euclid's division lemma then we can say that for any two numbers a and b where a is the dividend b is the divisor we can find two numbers q and r which satisfy this relation here value of r is always between Zero and b. So this is what the division lemma states. We use it normally in when we are doing the division. The problem, of course, comes when you have to prove it, when you have to do maths with it, maths with it, when we have to generalize it. Then the students have trouble. Based on this uh, division lemma, we there are questions asked. Okay, the questions are typically asking you. to look at the divisibility on proving the divisibility of numbers for example here we have a question which says that prove that this particular number a into a square plus 2 is always divisible by 3 so to start such a problem to solve such a problem we need to first understand that a can take three forms right so i'll solve this problem as an example but of course you would be asked to solve a different problem in your exam this is an example right so we have to first look at try to see what possible values a can be so i write it in the form of 3n then either a can be 3n or it can be of the form 3n plus 1 or it can be of the form 3n plus 2 so this covers the entire gamut of integers right i mean using just 3n 3n plus 1 and 3n plus 2 i can construct all possible integers so all the possible integers can be in one of these three forms so if i can show that this particular number if i substitute a for 3n a for 3n plus 1 and uh, sorry 3n plus 2 uh, for a if i can substitute one by one this this and this in this equation and show that in all these three cases the number which comes out is divisible by 3 then on on the whole for all integers this particular expression is always divisible by 3 so this is what our task is right in the beginning we can say that 3n with a equal to 3 n this number is divisible by 3 because 3 appears as one of its factors and herein lies the uh, usefulness of the division lemma now for the other two numbers 3 n plus 1 and 3 n plus 2 of course a right if a was of the form 3 n plus 1 then it could not this is a itself cannot be divisible by 3 the factor of 3 cannot come from this part this term the term a similarly if a was of the form 3n plus 2 then the factor which would uh, factor of 3 cannot come really from a okay so an example of number which is of form 3n would be 3 3n plus 1 the number would be 4 and 3n plus 2 example would be 5 of course you can see that the fa the factor of 3 can never come from 4 and 5 therefore in that case the factor of 3 has to come from a square plus 2 so what what do we do we substitute a as 3n plus 1 the whole square plus 2 if you look at it this becomes 9n square plus 6n plus 1 and then plus 2 this becomes 3 and of course this thing this term is then divisible by 3 okay because 3 is common factor to this this as well as this so this entire term is divisible by 3 so we have shown that a square plus 2 contains 3 as a factor when the number is of the form 3n plus 1 and therefore 3n plus 1 is uh, this number uh, for number of the form 3n plus 1 this expression is divisible by 3 
Similarly, we'll show that for number of form 3n plus 2, the 3n plus 2, again our expression, this a square plus 2 is divisible by 3. So in that case, again we write all the terms and we will see that all these terms are individually divisible by 3. This means this entire thing is divisible by 3, which means that even for numbers of the form 3n plus 2, this expression is divisible by 3. So we have shown that this expression is divisible by 3 for all possible forms 3n plus 1, 3n plus 2 and uh, 3n plus 1, 3n and 3n plus 2, all possible forms. So these are the kinds of questions which would be asked in your examination. Now let's move on to the uh, Euclid's division algorithm, right? So the Euclid's division algorithm is based on the Euclid's division lemma. It is used to find the SCF, like we already said. The problems are very, very simple. They are not really complicated. What does the algorithm say? How does it go? Let's say that there are two numbers A and B of which I have to find their SCF. According to this algorithm, the SCF of A and B Right. Let's say that I divide A by B. Okay, so I divide A by B and I get R as the remainder. So there would be some quotient Q, but ultimately I get, I follow the due process and I get R as the remainder. The theorem, the, the algorithm, what it says is that the SCF of A by B, uh, A and B would be the same as SCF of B and this remainder R. Okay. This remainder R which is obtained when uh, A is divided by B. This is the same and we continue in this fashion until we reach a point where this R completely divides B. Okay, so we continue until R completely divides B. R is a factor of B. It completely divides B. And at that point we say that this R is the SCF. So let's you look at an example and uh, understand this problem. So let's say that I have to find SCF of 9 and 15. That's what I have to find out. Like we said, we will keep this 9 as such. Okay, this is our B, this is our A. And I'll divide this 15 by 9. What would be the remainder? 9 was a 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 6 would be the remainder. And I write the remainder here. So the SCF of 9 and 15 would be this would be same as the SCF of 9 and the remainder obtained, right, which is 6, when the 15 is divided by 9. Okay. Of course, this would be same as the 6 and the remainder obtained when 9 is divided by 6. When 9 is divided by 6, we obtain 3 as remainder. And at this point, we need to stop. Why? Because our remainder R here is a factor of 6 which means that r would completely divide 6. At this point we stop and we say that the SCF of 9 and 15 is really equal to 3. So This is how this algorithm proceeds. Again very simple. Approach is systematically, conceptually if you understand it, very very simple. The problems on SCF are typically would ask you to find the maximum length. Okay, maximum length, maximum weight, maximum of something, okay, maximum of some quantity. If the problem is asking you to find that, you should understand that it's a clear indication that the problem is related to SCF. In this case, the answer, of course, would be SCF of 44, 22, and 55, which is trivial. It is 11. We all we can probably find that out. The next topic in this chapter is fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Again, it's like, it's like you don't, I mean, you don't really understand why do I have to study these things? It's very difficult to visualize. So definitely watch our videos which treat these uh, concepts in more detail. So definitely look at those. But at this level, at, at, in, this, in this video, we'll quickly cover it. So fundamental theorem of arithmetic, it states that every composite number, okay? So let's understand what is prime and what is composite. Prime number P is a number which is greater than 1. Okay, So 1 is not included. 1 is neither prime nor composite. So 1 is not included. Prime number P is a number greater than 1 which is which has only two numbers as its factors. Either number itself or 1. Okay, So prime number P is a number greater than 1 which has only two factors. The number itself and 1. 
Another definition is prime number p is a number greater than 1 which cannot be written as product of some other numbers. Okay, that is the other uh, other than 1 and itself. Okay, so if I have to write the number p as a product of a number other than 1 and itself, okay, if I, I have to write it this way and I cannot, then that number would be prime. Of course, prime is greater than, is always a number bigger than 1. So those are the two definitions. The idea is simple. Prime number has no factors other than 1 and itself in either case. Now, to understand the theorem, we are saying that every composite number, for example, let's take a number 6, every composite number, let's say number 6, number 6 is not really a prime number, so let's take that. It can be written, it can be written as a product of primes, which is true, I can write three, 6 as 3 into 2, 3 and 2 are both prime numbers. And this factorization is unique. The way of writing this 6 is unique. See, I can change the order of these factors. I can write, instead of writing 6 as 3 into 2, I can write it as 2 into 3. But it means one and the same thing. The factors, the underlying factors which make the number are exactly the same. They are indeed the same. They are 3 and 2. They are both there in 6. And they are. that is the only way I can express 6. If I have to write express 6 in the form of prime factors, this, are, this is the only way I can write it. There are only 2 and only 2 prime factors, 3 and 2. It is a unique signature. And this is unique to this. Every number has this unique signature. That is what the definition of this fundamental theorem of arithmetic is. It is very powerful theorem, very important theorem. It's very important to understand it. It is not a given, right? You understand, right? That that all numbers, let's say any take any any number, any large number, 1, 2, 6, 8, 9, 7. It is not a given that this particular number can be expressed as a product of primes. Okay, it is not a given. But this theorem gives us that power that yes, indeed, it is factorizable. Every number is factorizable as product of primes. And that factorization is unique. Okay, if we ignore the order, don't look at the order, that factorization is unique. Of course, then applications are there of this number. We are needed, we are required to find the find, uh, prime factors. We can use the division method, we can use the factor 3 method, the, the, either of those is uh, uh, okay. LCM and SCF will be required to find. Okay, we can use the prime factorization to find LCM and SCF. SCF, we can also use our uh, Euclid's algorithm to find the SCF. And of course, one important theorem on which you will be asked to uh, find, uh, do problems, solve problems is this. SCF into LCM of two numbers is equal to the product of those two numbers. Okay, so if I find the LCM of two numbers, a and B and I find their HCF of A into B, sorry, A comma B, then indeed that is equal to this product is equal to the product of the two numbers itself. It's very important. Now, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, we continue it that way. And then uh, we come on to this important theorem, which is again very, very important because problems would be asked based on this theorem. What does it say? It says that if a number P is a prime and p divides a square okay so number p is prime and it divides a square what does that really mean let's say that my number a consists of from the fundamental theorem of arithmetic i can write that i can always write the number p as products of primes so i am writing it as product of prime okay and of course there will be certain powers right i can express it as certain powers of prime what does this mean? It means that a square would again consist of only these prime factors p1, p2, p3. No new prime factors have been created in a square. right? Whatever prime factors were there already in a, a square would inherit it, a cube would also inherit it. Okay? There are no new prime factors which can be created. Okay? It is intrinsic. a has certain prime factors, a square would have the same uh, number of uh, same prime factors okay their their quantity might change okay but the it cannot create any new prime factors okay if there are if the prime factor is missing in a then it cannot suddenly appear in a square so that what does that mean it means that if the number p were to divide this a square which means that p exists here in p1 p2 p3 it exists here already okay which me it means that this if P can divide A square, it means that it, it exists here, right? It exists in as one of the terms here, P1, P2 and P3. What does that mean? It means that because it exists in A square, 
this number pre also exists also must exist exist as a factor of a and therefore i can write a as p into c bringing out the factor p this is what this theorem is saying again very very powerful theorem let's move on now we have come on to rational numbers now rational numbers are of course very very simple conceptually they are always of the form p by q they are denoted by the set okay if you if you are interested in that now here p and q are co prime what does that mean it means that i have removed all possible factors from p and q so let's take an example 6 by 9 okay this is a, a rational number but it is not in its lowest form there is a factor common to 6 and 9 i'll have to remove it i would extract it from both 6 and 9 and here it becomes 2 and this becomes 3 okay 3 was the common factor and now 2 by 3 is a rational number here p and q our uh, p and q are co prime there are no common factors between p and q okay note that p and q do not necessarily have to be prime they are only co prime for example 15 sorry 4 by 15 is a rational number because there are no common factors between 4 and 15 although 4 and 15 themselves and either of them is not prime prime factorization of q is of the form this okay so now we are saying that the the rational number is always of this form okay we are saying that the rational number it when we convert it to decimal it can take two forms either it can be a terminating decimal which means that it takes a form a b c and then after after little while okay maybe after five digits after 10 digits at some point it definitely stops so there is a clear end here okay or it could be of the form where it it repeats okay when it repeats then also it's a rational number okay rational number when i convert to decimal it can take only one of these two forms either it can be terminating the decimal expansion stops or it can be repeating which means it continues but it repeats okay it's the same pattern of digits which would come again and again that those are the only two forms and this is what this is saying if it is of the form terminating form that is it it is of the form 0. a b c after a while it stops then i can always write it as a b c divided by okay howsoever many digits are here i can always add these many zeros in the denominator and convert it into a rational number p by q form p by q and therefore this is what this is saying if it is a rational number whose dec decimal expansion terminates if it terminates the expansion terminates then i can always express it x in the form of p by q where p and q are co prime where a and this denominator are co prime a b c dot 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 and this are co prime and prime factorization of q is of the form 2 2 raised to power n 5 raised to power m okay so this is of course of the form 2 raised to power n into 5 raised to power here our power of n and n are similar because we have written 10 okay but 10 can be written as 2 into 5 therefore this denominator can be expressed like this now if our numerator this p was an even number then i would cancel certain number of twos okay and then i would get in the denominator 2 raised to power m and 5 raised to power n okay this is what we are saying but the key idea is i can always write a terminating decimal in the form of p by q by first removing all the uh, the decimal from the numerator and adding many zeros as many zeros as required in the denominator and then simplifying it simplifying it means that removing the twos okay well, if if the uh, numerator is a uh, even number then i can cancel out certain number of twos and in the denominator i would get a number which is of the form 2 raised to power n 5 raised to power n and if the denominator of this form conversely right if i if i have a number q by 2 raised to power n 5 raised to power m conversely right i can always express it in the form of a non uh, terminating but non repeating decimal okay, that is conversely that's what i would say and why is that the case because i can make 
this 2 raised to power n and 5 raised to power m I can convert and write it as 10 into 10 okay I can multiply the top by as many 2's as I as I need to to complete these 5's into 10's so I can always complete the 5's into 10's and then I will convert this as 2 raised to power 10 raised to power m okay m m and then this I can uh, write it as decimal because they are m zeros here so I would shift the decimal point m times backwards and I would get a decimal number of the form 0 0.00 something q okay that is the key idea right that is the, what the, the theorem is saying as long as my denominator is of this form I can always convert it into a uh, terminating decimal in the, on the other hand if the prime factorization of q is not of this form denominator is cannot be expressed in this form then I would end up with a number which is non-terminating and repeating example is 1 by 3 1 by 3 is here yeah, 3 is not of this form okay 3 is not entirely made up of factors of 2 and 5 therefore 1 by 3 if I convert it into a, a decimal then this becomes a terminating uh, non-terminating but repeating decimal so I'll have many many threes here okay so either I can write it as 3 3 dot 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 or in simply I can write it as 3 uh, dot okay that is this indicates non-terminating but recurring decimal the decimal never terminates it continues but it is recur because the same pattern of 3 would continue to repeat now what has not been given in in your book is the fact that there are numbers called irrational numbers what are irrational numbers irrational numbers cannot be expressed in the form p by q which means that their decimal expansion is non-terminating and non-repeating okay so it continues a b c c it is it never repeats and there is it never ends and such decimal expansions result in a number which cannot be written in the form p by q and those we call irrational numbers so roots for example are irrational numbers root 2 root 3 they are irrational numbers in general root of any prime number is an irrational number the pi that we encounter uh, in in geometry okay is also an irrational number their decimal expansion never terminates and it never repeats so let's try to see why why this is the case why why is that that root p is always where p is a prime number is always irrational so for this again we use proof by contradiction so we first just assume that root p is not irrational but it is indeed rational which means i can express it in the form of a by b where a and b are co-prime right? so this is important that they are co-prime what does this mean? It means that I can write it as p is equal to a square by b square which means that p b square is equal to a square. Now we understand from here that this p is a factor of a square. Now where can that factor come from? Right? a square cannot produce any new factor just, square, just by squaring I cannot produce any new factors. Therefore, this factor of p has to be there in a itself. Therefore, we can write a as pc. We already proved this, if you remember. Now, a square becomes p square, c square. Therefore, I can write b square is equal to b square into p. p b square is equal to p square c square, where c is also a natural number, uh, an integer. Now, from here I can write b square is equal to p c square. This p and this p would cancel and I would be left with only one p. So, b square is equal to p c square. What does this mean? It means that p is a factor of b square, which in turn would mean that p is a factor of b. Okay, so p is a factor of b. Now since p is a factor of b and this p is also a factor of a 
So P is a factor of both A and B. They were, therefore, our initial assumption that they were co-prime becomes incorrect. What does this mean by contradiction? We are saying that our initial assumption that root P can be expressed in this form is actually incorrect and root P is an irrational number which can never be expressed in the form A by B. So again, uh, in the exam, you would be asked to show various kinds of irrational numbers and you would be asked to prove that indeed why are they irrational and you would uh, always use the same technique. You would first assume that they are rational numbers and then you'll prove by contradiction. So in this case, sorry, we will say P by Q and then we will say that this may, means that this is equal to Q which is equal to root 3. Then we will say that 5 by minus Q can is a rational number. It can always be expressed as A by B. Now here on this side we have a rational number and on this side we have a irrational number. Since root 3 can never be expressed in this form, our initial assumption that this was indeed a rational number is actually incorrect and this turns out with this we can prove that 5 minus root 3 is irrational. Okay, So this is the technique. In each case this is the technique that you would use and you would just assume that root 3, root 5, root 7, root of any prime number is irrational. You would just assume that you can probably write it here since root p where p is a prime is irrational. Okay, you can write that. Now with this, we complete all the topics of your class 10th. You should be clear on all of these topics. It's, it is again uh, chapter first, okay, the, the real numbers, the number theory topics. These are all very important and of course, they are very, very scoring. So don't miss those. Thank you.